Hi everybody, it's Nancy Bell and I'm so excited to be with you again today for uh, the continuation of your great learning adventure. This time it's Ask Nancy and I'm going to answer your questions. A lot of people sent in questions. In fact, there were so many questions that we're going to do this again in a couple of weeks. I couldn't get to all the questions in the time that I wanted to do this. So here's what we're going to start with. I'm going to do a very quick review of what Linda Mood Bell's philosophy is on the sensory input necessary for uh, being able to process language, read, decode, do math, etc. And then I'm going to answer your questions on topics like dyslexia, phonological and orthographic processing, uh, ADHD vocabulary, young students, adults, and I'm going to end with a question that was asked to me about traumatic brain injury. And it's very important to me that we reach out to individuals that have had uh, uh, an accident or a stroke in trying to help them with our particular philosophy on imagery's relationship to cognition. And so I'm excited for you to see that. I'm going to do that at the end where you're going to get to see a video of a young man who is a veteran and experienced a TBI from being, uh, I believe it was Iraq, being Iraq. So let's just start with our quick review. Um, the underlying cause of weak language and literacy skills, and if we go the K, look at the K-12 pipeline, here's first grade, here's second grade, et cetera, on up. The underlying cause of weak language and literacy skills, in our opinion, is at the sensory level, and I've talked a lot about this. It's not poor teaching, bad parenting, um, probably not a lot of things that, that we have thought it maybe was, uh, in the field of education, we believe here very strongly that the challenge we all have is to diagnose what is happening at the sensory level for the students that come to us. And they come to us from all ages and all backgrounds. <clears throat> so while there can be other things that are causing, other issues that are causing weaknesses in a weakness in processing language, we believe that when you go back to this K-12 pipeline, the two primary weaknesses that prevent an individual from going through school at that uh, first grade, second grade, third grade reading level, staying on target with that, we think that the primary culprit is twofold. And that is, or the primary, the primary problem is weak decoding and weak comprehension. However, there's only one primary cause in our opinion, and that is weakness in the imagery language uh, connection. I hope by the end of what I'm talking about with you today and answering these questions, you'll see that we have an awful lot of data, including um, randomized controlled studies that say that that's actually right. So um, the sensory input the brain, as you know, can only receive information through the senses. And the sensory input of imagery underlies language and literacy skills. Sometimes I talk about dual coding theory and sometimes I don't. And I decided in answering your questions today that I wanted to make sure that we're clear on dual coding theory and how dual coding theory matches what we have experienced in, in teaching students to uh, read and spell, comprehend, do math, etc. And this is Dr. Alan Pavio, and he says something I really want you to understand as we go through this. Cognition is proportional, and everything we're talking about, and I'm answering your questions today, is about cognition. Cognition is proportional to the extent that the coding mechanisms of mental representations, imagery, and language are integrated. He says that it, performance is mediated in all of our cognitions, mediated by the joint activity of the verbal and the nonverbal systems. And the nonverbal system that we're talking about and he's talking about is imagery. One time at dinner, I asked him, um, how has it been in his long life to uh, 
try to help the world understand about the importance of imagery. And he said to me, it's been a little bit of heaven and a little bit of hell trying to get people to understand the importance of imagery. So we have had long, uh, Al Pavio and I have had long conversations about imagery and he understands that I think that there's basically two types of imagery, of visual imagery, parts and holes. And if you've been on this adventure with me before, you know that this is symbol imagery and this one over here is concept imagery. Symbol imagery is imagery for sounds and letters within words. If you're thinking that only phonological awareness is needed for reading, you need to put in your head clearly that reading is a visual medium. You also have to, you can't, we don't read and spell with just sounds. We read and spell with sounds and letters. Concept imagery is imaging the whole, the gestalt, it's completely the opposite of uh, symbol imagery. It's imaging the gestalt so that then from that you can do higher order thinking skills. So as you think about imagery then, how are those related to the component parts of reading? Again, this is something that I, this Venn diagram is something I created in the 70s. Uh, that we have word attack skills, word recognition skills, and paragraph reading all as subsets of this greater set of being able to comprehend. Now, if we look at imagery, and let me just back up for a second, I want to make sure that we're clear that that is concept imagery, and all of these, this one is related to phonological awareness and symbol imagery, this one's symbol imagery, and then the combination of all of this is applied with symbol imagery over to fluency in contextual reading and vocabulary, or for contextual reading and vocabulary. So if we now come to imagery in the language processing spectrum, we can think that if you have weak decoding and weak comprehension, those two things I said are the uh, primary reason that students don't make a year for a year gain is they're going through school and they don't experience success like maybe some of the other students are. If, if there's weakness in decoding, for example, it's in these inner circles, word attack, word recognition, and paragraph reading. If there's weakness in comprehension, often these students, well, let me back up for a second, Sometimes these students that have weakness here have great comprehension. If they can just decode enough, then they are able to comprehend. Or they can comprehend what uh, someone is talking to them about in content or, or talking to them with oral language. They, their issue isn't with language comprehension. And let me see if I can erase that. Oof. And now if we turn Hang on. If we turn to this student over here with comprehension, weak comprehension, this student often has all of those inner circles filled in, excellent decoding, excellent word attack, excellent paragraph reading, often even good oral vocabulary, yet their weak concept imagery impacts their reading comprehension and their oral language comprehension. So. This is, uh, has been said to me so many times, that this is the hidden, um, and they've used the term with me, the hidden disability, the hidden challenge. And that is that it's not easy to see that, that someone can have trouble with just comprehension. Now, if it's weak enough, over here, this individual can be labeled dyslexic. If it's weak enough, this individual can be lab labeled hyperlexic or on the spectrum of autism, just to give you a, a starting place of gestalt from which to, to go forward and answering your questions. Now, clearly, if we are going to be able at Linda Mood Bell to make a difference for these students, if they come in to us and say, t t come to us in 10th grade or 2nd grade or 6th grade, we have to diagnose to find the cause of the difficulty or the struggle with language and literacy skills. So, for example, I have to find out is 
this person experiencing difficulty on this side? Is the person experiencing difficulty over here in comprehension or is it both? In order to do that, we put students through an extensive learning evaluation. And those, the tests that we use, and this is one of the questions I was asked, the, quest that, the, the tests that we use are all standardized tests. They're not our tests, except for two of them. And I don't know if they're on there. Yep. And that is a symbol imagery test and the Linda Mood auditory conceptualization test. Pat Linda Mood developed this test with little colored blocks to see, uh, to diagnose if you were able to perceive sounds and words many years ago. It's one of the best tests for phonological awareness uh, on the market uh, or for your use. And then, I don't know, a number of years ago, I developed a test for symbol imagery. This one is going to measure phonological awareness. This one is going to measure orthographic awareness, if you want to think of it that way. Or sometimes people think of it as phonological memory. I think of it as orthographic memory, and we'll get into that as I answer the questions. So the first question is, now that you have that big picture, the first question comes from the United Kingdom. I am a, an SLT, which is a speech language therapist in the United Kingdom, and would like to know what age children can start working on visualizing. Notice that's how you spell it in the UK. I generally work with children from 3 to 11 years old and really want to improve higher order thinking and comprehension, particularly in the five plus age group? Here's my answer. You can start with, no, let's put this pipeline back. You can absolutely start with four, five, and six year olds, teaching them to visualize. I have data on that. As a matter of fact, I want you to know that as I'm answering your questions today, I'm trying not only to answer from my opinion and my experience, but also the data that we have uh, from 30 years of working with thousands of students. So uh, I have a couple of thoughts on this. First of all, yes, you can develop imagery for young children, and yes, you should. I have grandchildren now, which is why my um, why my hands look like my mother's hands. Uh, it's kind of a scary thing that I frequently notice. Um, and when I bring my grandchildren to bed with me, even when they were very young, I would always tell them stories. And I made the stories high in imagery, sometimes scary. And I believe that my three-year-olds and my four-year-olds were absolutely able to visualize those because in a, uh, the next time I would ask them if they wanted to hear a story, they would say, Nanny, can you tell me the story about such and such? And when I would start the story again, because they're not written, written down, they're just from my head, they would stop me and say, no, that's not what happened. Nanny, it, it, that's what happened. And then I would realize that, that their imagery, uh, as one would expect, it helped them with memory. The other thing that, that I want to tell you is that we can actually do formal, which we have done here clinically, formal instruction in imagery, both the SI program and the VB program, and I'll show you that data. The, the one thing that, that I want you to know is that you'll have to slow down the steps a little bit. Uh, a four-year-old and a five-year-old and a six-year-old may respond a little bit differently in terms of pacing through the steps of our programs than say a 12 year old or an adult even. So here's some data. So we, my answer is yes, you can do that and yes, you can develop higher order thinking skills with that. So this data is uh, young students, their average age is uh, five and a half and it's uh, 1,548 students. This is where we were doing a lot of symbol imagery uh, with the students and we got, and we did VV with them, we got a vocabulary change on standard scores that was very high. I, I want to make sure you understand how to think about standard scores. Standard scores are tracked differently than percentiles. 
they talk about a standard deviation from the norm or the mean. So that's considered the mean, and it can be thought of sometimes as 10, or it can be looked at as 100, or reported that way. When you, when you get a gain like this, it means you've gained points. You've tracked your way up to that mean, and this is a very large gain, uh, or a large gain. This is really large in that these five-year-olds gained in word recognition skills uh, 10 points or 10 units on standard score changes. Same thing that if you look at, now this is just a little bit different, this is looking at percentiles, which is a different way to look at uh, statistics. These students came in at the 18th percentile, and percentiles, and I think most of you know this, go first to 99th, and, and maybe most of you don't know it. A lot of, I have to apologize for that, because a lot of the questions that came to me were from parents, and so I want to make sure that what I'm talking to you about is simplified enough for uh, you to be able to understand, not that you need things uh, talk to you <laughs> simply, or present to you simply, but because you might not have the experience for it. So if you're looking at percentiles, they go 99th, first to 99th, so 50th is in right in the middle, 25th to 75th is considered normal range. So you can see that these students came in at the 18th percentile, which is way down here, and they went up to a normal range. But this is the biggest one that I wanted to show uh, or talk, respond to the person the speech and language therapist from uh, the UK. She's wanting to develop comprehension with these students. And I thought this was important enough for me just to show it to you like this. These average standard score changes here are huge in comprehension. So if you're thinking now between SI and CI, where you're doing the visualizing verbalizing program for concept imagery development, you can see that it's absolutely worth your time. Next question. I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for intervention for a student with orthographic dyslexia. Something that I've not heard a lot uh, talked about in the field of education, but you know that I believe that, there, that it's very important that individuals develop orthographic processing. So this person saying, I'm thinking a heavy dose of seeing stars, and what do I think? So without question, I think that we do need to develop the symbol imagery component that would apply here, here, and combined for paragraph reading. But let me explain a little bit more about orthographic processing. We know that we have talked about phonological processing uh, a lot. There's been a lot of talk about phonological awareness that we actually initiated, Pat Lindemood initiated, was a pioneer in that field. And there's no question that there is phonological awareness involved in word attack skills, but that phonological awareness has to make its way up to symbol imagery in order for orthographic processing to be available to our student when he or she is, in this case, he is reading a book. So let me show you this. Orthographic processing involves orthographic coding, described as representing a printed word in memory and accessing the whole word unit, a component letter, or a letter cluster unit. This is imagery. So I'm going to give you that. I just want you to experience it. I know some people have uh, heard me speak before and have done this, but some people have not that are now amongst, I believe, the hundreds that are watching this. So got it? What, what symbol imagery means is that I can show you that, and then I can take it away and ask you to tell me the third letter or the fourth letter, and you should be able to hold on to it. So when I first developed the symbol imagery test, and it's related to orthographic processing and me trying to answer this question for you, I ran correlations on 717 students. And what's important about the data that you're seeing now, I looked at the symbol imagery test and compared it to tests of reading. And the magnitude of, in the correlation was very strong to word attack, 
the SI test to word attack, the SI test to spelling, the SI test to word recognition, and the SI test to paragraph reading. And, and that's all interesting. I then decided I would compare it to phoneme awareness, and so I took a look at the SI test and how it correlated with our LAC test, and you can see that there was a very large correlation. Uh, and I also correlated it, correlated it to the CTOP. And you can see that's phonological awareness, rapid naming, and phonological memory. Okay? But the most interesting thing that we did was we looked at whether it, the SI test could predict, let me say it again, could predict performance in reading. So we took the SI test and we looked at it compared to word attack, word recognition, spelling, reading rate, accuracy, and fluency. And in every case, without going into a lot of detail, in every case, the SI test was more predictive than these other tests, the LAC test and then the phonological tests in the CTOP. So there is no question in my mind that what they were talking about here with orthographic processing is critical for uh, being a global reader, a reader that can read without having to sound out every word. I decided in putting this together for you that I wanted to give you a little bit more information on that. A men the mental representation involved in orthographic processing. Now remember, word recognition, we have to do more than sound out words when we read on the page. We have to be able to recognize them like that in order to improve our fluency. So here's what Ari said. Linnea Ari said, the mental representation involved in orthographic processing was termed by Ari in 1980 as an orthographic image. An orthographic image, according to Virginia Berninger, can be scanned in memory, contains all the letters in the word spelling, and serves as a symbols for both spoken and silent sounds. So what happens when we do just symbol imagery only, and I'll quickly go through some of these, Word attack, you can see even for the severe students, the gains are significant. And this is with 108 hours. Word recognition, significant. Accuracy, significant. Significant for all the students, but I'm really concerned about those ones that might be labeled dyslexic to answer this question. Paragraph reading comprehension, look at that, in 112 hours. And I slipped the slide in there um, because I wanted you to see that when we do SI only, and if you look over here at the SI test, we should get the gains on that test because essentially we are teaching to that test. And so I'm happy that we got that score, but what we do with the SI program and what we test for are very similar. But our test for phonological awareness has students using little colored blocks that in the SI program they never see, they never do. So I was really interested to see if we could change phonological awareness, and indeed we can, where they have never seen those colored blocks, they've never moved them to represent sounds and words. And then the last thing I'm going to talk to you about in orthographic processing is this is a randomized controlled study at Georgetown, and this was with dyslexic children. We, we saw these significant changes in in uh, these areas, word attack comprehension. But what's important here for all of you is that this grave vo matter volume changes actually showed um, increased volume at the end of intervention. Now remember, we had a control group. And that these included those parts of the brain involved in memory and mental imagery. And the most important thing here is that those changes maintained or increased after the intervention ended. And so this is a slide of showing the intervention at the beginning. This is the test, test one, test two, and you can see how those changes uh, grew significantly. And then there's no intervention in here. And look at these areas of the brain continuing to either uh, grow or be maintained. Very exciting stuff. Now, question three. How long would it typically take to tutor a dyslexic child starting at age eight versus starting at age 12? What are the negative effects of waiting until the child is older to get the proper tutoring? 
So now we're saying that, that this is a child, if we're saying the child is dyslexic in this question, we're, we're not looking, probably, we're not thinking that this child may have substantive comprehension problems. What we're thinking is when we do diagnostic testing that the, and we'll stick vocabulary here, when we look at these um, scores, it might be that for the eighth grader, their you know, word attack skills are three years below, They're, or two years below. Their word recognition might be four or five years below. I don't know until we do the testing, and the paragraph reading may be uh, more impacted than that. Um, so if we're thinking then, and this question is about an eight-year-old versus the 12-year-old, um, the question is how much time. And in my experience, the eight-year-old, and again, it depends on what the, the, the learning evaluation says. If the eight-year-old comes in with a moderate amount of weakness in imaging, phonological awareness, word attack, et cetera, and that whole rate, testing profile that we do, then that child, because of the profile, because this is a differentiated instruction that we would be doing with that child based on the learning ability evaluation, that child might not need as much time in treatment. Um, however, if it's an eight-year-old and it's a severe dyslexic, that child, because of the child's age, might need more time. Everything's gonna depend, I really want you to get this take-home message here. Everything depends on what the strengths and weaknesses look like for those individual children in that learning ability evaluation. However, if all things were just typical, more than likely it would be better to start the child younger as opposed to waiting until they get older. Why would that be? The older the child gets, the more time they have had to lose gains compared to lose progress compared to their grade level. So we have a new slide at Linda Mood Bell that is based on this compulsory um, pipeline. And this shows pre and post-test data from our learning centers. And again, it's not a controlled study, it's just from our learning centers, but we do have controlled studies. Um, this is for our decoding only students, and we're just looking at the test of word recognition. The average amount of hours, which is virtually very little, is 101 hours. And here's the pipeline. See the black line right there? That's the pipeline. K, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, etc. This um, pre test. The pretest line is red, and it's right here. And you can see that these students fall off more and more and more as they get older when we see them. So there's a bigger gap here when we see them than here when we see them. But what's interesting is this blue line, this is post. Let me erase some of this so you can see it better. I want you to be able to see that blue line. This is the gain between the red line and the blue line. And you can see that we're getting these very significant gains in 101 hours of instruction. However, even with this almost two year gain here, and here, and here, what you see is the older the students get, they can't make it up as fast. So even though they get the gains, on the average, they, they, the longer you wait, the more trouble they're going to have making it up. So what does that tell you? These students need more time. Okay? Here it is now in looking at comprehension. It's, the, it's essentially the same picture. The gains in comprehension are substantial. What's, I think, interesting about this, this is their pre, remember? Their red line is their pre. And look at this pre. They're not too far behind, but look at what happens right around fourth grade, which is what all of us would think, because in fourth grade, they're probably asked uh, to do more higher order thinking skills. And so the, obviously the gains are significant, but even then, they can't catch up.
the longer you wait. So they need more time. Question four. I'm a 26-year-old woman who has struggled throughout my career, unable to advance in school and the workforce. I did not receive the best reading help from my early years of school, and I had a dysfunctional childhood and not a stable living environment. Can you help me? And my heart goes out to this person because this person is on the other side of 12th grade. This person, what we know is at the end of 12th grade, you can you have some choices, college, work, and hopefully not jail, which ends up happening to some of those kids that have really fallen off here. So here she is. She's 26 years old, and I'll bet you, I'll bet you anything she blames herself instead of blaming that there was perhaps not the accurate diagnosis nor accurate treatment uh, for uh, intervention for her. So the first thing that I would have to say to this individual is I need to do, we need to do a learning ability evaluation. We have to determine what is causing the weakness. Is, it, is she, for example, only experiencing difficulty here? Therefore, is not able to read words accurately, doesn't read fluently. I wouldn't know until I saw her. Or are all of these filled in and her weakness is in comprehension only, or is it both? And that's the purpose of doing the learning ability evaluation. I put in some uh, data that we have in working with adults. Um, this is decoding only in case her question is that she needs help in these circles. And you can see the average score changes, standard score changes, after 113 hours of instruction. And our mean age is 24. You can also see that we don't work with as many adults as we do um, students that are still in kindergarten through 12th grade. Why would that be? Largely, they have probably given up. They're hoping to hang on in, in a job, which is probably difficult for them. And they don't really think that there can be any help. Remember what she said to me? Can you help me? Breaks my heart. You look at these score changes, her standard deviation scores, her accuracy, her word attack, her, not her, but the, our word attack uh, scores for those um, individuals, it's all very, very high. Reading rate and spelling, still significant, but not as much. But these are life-changing results for these individuals. If we look at comprehension only, now these are the students that would have, take you back, these are the students that would have these score, these subsets all filled in, and their weakness would be only comprehension. <clears throat> they came in with an, a vocabulary at the 37th percentile, but comprehension at the 14th percentile. So it's not vocabulary that's impacting them. And they improve from the 14th to the 27th percentile and 19th to the 37th percentile in oral directions. That's with only 102 hours. I want you to know that I believe earnestly that if we took these students and did double this, with that at 204 hours, we could shoot that up more. Even with that, the standard deviation for those students in comprehension is a very uh, good change. Question five. Do students with poor vocabulary do well with VV? Or is it more difficult to teach them to visualize if they don't know the meaning of words? So let's think about that for a second. This has always been something that we have been concerned about. So you're trying to get the student able to um, comprehend what they read, and they have no difficulty, mostly just the, the, the VV-only students have no difficulty uh, decoding words. And then they're going to come to some words where they don't have, not a decoding problem, but where they don't have the meaning. So what is it that enables you to know the meaning of a word? If you, if you ask yourself that, you'll take yourself right back to Alpavio in that vocabulary 
is cognition. He's done a lot of studies on that. And the more concrete the word, the higher the, the imagery response. So I want to make this big statement to you. Imagery is the sensory foundation for vocabulary. When we have students that have difficulty understanding the meaning of words, we take visualizing and verbalizing and we apply it to vocabulary. So for example, if I say to you, horse, you, I dual code it this way, I dual image it, excuse me, this way. I see H-O-R-S-E, but I also see a horse and I can make the horse white, I can make the horse black, and as soon as I say black, I turn the horse and color in my head to black. Um, I believe you probably do the same thing for vocabulary words. I was once in a classroom observing um, a teacher who was really good with visualizing and verbalizing, really good with our LIPS program, really good with our Seed Stars program, and she was trying to develop vocabulary for her students. And uh, I believe the word was skyscraper. Now when I say skyscraper, you probably image something. She said to the students, um, what is the meaning of skyscraper? And really, by doing that, she didn't activate any sensory input. And so, remember I started talking to you about we believe that there's a sensory connection to language and the sensory input that I'm talking to you about is imagery. It would have been very, a very different experience for her students if she had said, what do you picture for a skyscraper? Then they could talk about height, they could talk about color, they could enhance their imagery. Imagery. So if we look now back to dual coding theory, he will say performance is mediated by the joint activity of the verbal and the nonverbal systems, and that applies to vocabulary just as, as well as it applies to reading comprehension. So to answer this woman's question, or this man's question, I'm not sure actually, um, do students with poor vocabulary do well with VV? No, unless you develop their vocabulary through imagery. You, you have to be able to visualize words before you can visualize sentences. So here's our comprehension only students with a pretest vocabulary at or below the 37th percentile. And I'm going to go back and look at it below even the 25th. This is with an N of 1,800 students, um, average amount of hours of instruction was 113. And you can look at these scores and see with weaker vocabulary, we can still, if we work on vocabulary, we can still get the changes that, or the big gains on, in comprehension. Question six, almost done. My 10-year-old son was diagnosed with severe ADHD by privately hired doctors due to many years of academic failure in public school. According to two doctors' reports, a speech-language pathologist evaluation and a psychologist psychoeducational evaluation, his ADHD symptoms of inattention were the main cause of his academic failure. So this is an important question for me to answer or discuss with you. The issue is language processing versus the symptoms of ADHD. We, we do not draw blood and, and note that this person has ADHD or ADD. How we know or how we diagnose someone with ADHD is we look at behaviors, right? And we maybe ask questions about how the, the child is responding to things in the classroom or responding to things at home, etc. To, to make that diagnosis. Um, but what we have to think of is that there's a what's called a comorbidity with ADHD and language processing deficits. Uh, the data says that the students that have been diagnosed with ADHD, at least 50% of them have substantive language pro processing deficits. So this gentleman um, wants to know, I believe, if I think that there could be more than just 
ADD causing him academic failure? And my response is, I wouldn't know until we look at his language processing. So we're back to a learning ability evaluation. And why is that important? If, if, if I'm struggling in school to read words, or I'm struggling in school to understand what I read or understand the questions asked of me, the demands of school or the demands of, of us in, at home or in society, if I'm struggling, it's going to cause me some stress. And I believe that, that what I would have done is I would have checked out. I would have done other things that I felt more comfortable with or other things to take uh, maybe um, the, the feeling away from me as having difficulty, but me, me, I mean, let me put it this way. I haven't changed what I'm going to say. Pat Lindemood and I used to talk a lot about the students that came to us with a label of ADD and ADHD. And that was because many years ago, it almost was like an epidemic when we were first opening only two or three centers instead of the 63 we have now. We would talk a lot about how many children were coming to us with medication and whether or not we thought that the problem was the attention deficit or the language processing problems. We always believed that those children that were coming to us and we were giving them a diagnostic testing that we could improve their attention. And I think that it's important in answering this question that whether or not it's um, pure attention deficit, you have to find out. And the way to find out is to look at that individual's, that boy, that 10-year-old boy's strengths and weaknesses in processing language and rule out that, um, that the problem of attention isn't maybe a smoke screen, which is what Pat and I would talk about. We would think, we would talk endlessly that maybe that child that is having trouble over there and doesn't seem to want to sit still and has uh, and demonstrates all the behaviors of attention deficit, maybe that child set up a smoke screen uh, to make it seem like he didn't have learning disabilities. I don't know if that was the case, but I know that when we were able to change, if they had substantive language processing issues, when we were able to change that, a lot of those behaviors could subside and they would become more confident. That's not to say, that's not to say that there couldn't be something as pure as, as couldn't be something that would be pure ADHD, but you need to rule this out first in terms of language processing. There's another question similar. I've been told my 12-year-old daughter has an attention deficit. She has been tested based on observation in the classroom, fourth grade, and her actions at home. After several years of resisting meds, my husband and I have succumbed to a low dosage of medications, and I have seen little or no improvement. My question to you is, is there a program that you have that would help her with this issue? Mom. Now, I don't know, again, I don't know for this mom, I don't know if this child has learning or language processing issues, and I don't know what those specific issues might be. So for example, it could be that all of this, these are intact, and her language processing issue is with concept imagery, not symbol imagery. And I'll know that as soon as I do diagnostic testing. If, for example, I include a slide just this morning. If, for example, she has substantive comprehension issues, that, that medication won't change that. It might change her ability to attend, but if she has substantive concept imagery issues where she cannot create those mental representations, she's going to need very specific intervention to help her. So I said to myself, I want to show you this category of students that I call severe, where they have severe language comp reading comprehension problems. We, 
uh, looked at 500 students that are in this severe category that had 102 hours of VV. Their comprehension came in at the 8th percentile. Their vocabulary was at the 39th percentile. And if I had all the scores here, all of their scores in decoding, all those inner circles are way up. After 102 hours, the mean change was from the 8th percentile to the 47th percentile. I, I think that, again, I, I can't be specific uh, for her child because I haven't seen the diagnostic testing, but the first thing she needs to do is have the child go through um, our diagnostic testing or maybe if she's had some diagnostic testing, she's, I'm happy for her to send it to me and I can look it over. Uh, but that's the first thing that has to happen for your daughter. Is there a program that you have that would help her with this issue? I won't know which program it is until I do the diagnostic testing. Now, I decided to answer both of those questions related to ADD by looking at our data in-house. And these are for the decoding only students that had um, an average of 110 hours, and you can see that these are good changes in here. Accuracy, word recognition. What's interesting here is how those decoding students improve their um, word attack scores, their phonological uh, awareness improved. And if we now take a look at those same students with their standard score changes, you can again see that other than spelling and reading rate, that was just a medium change. All of those changes are good for those students. If you look at comprehension only, to give this mother some hope, um, <clears throat> this is with an N of 843, 102 hours. What's encouraging here is to see that their comprehension score has changed um, for written language comprehension and oral language comprehension in a relatively short period of time. Uh, recently, uh, we looked at our ADH, um, ADH, ADHD students and saw that, that ADHD has, is now the uh, biggest category of students that come to us with a pre-diagnosis. It's, it's in ADHD. That's very interesting. And I suspect it's because it is the easier one to diagnose because it's diagnosed on behaviors. Question eight, do you have, and this is our last question, do you have any experience with adults with the diagnosis of TBI, traumatic brain injury, who have lost their ability to read and write? And yes, we do. Um, I'm going to have you take just a few moments and watch a video of a young man that I was talking about earlier. His name is Ian. It's very moving to see that we made a difference for him. The amount of suicides for our vets, uh, or the number of suicides for our vets is staggering on a daily basis for our vets that have TBI and also that have post-traumatic stress syndrome. So one of the things that I want to do at Linda Mood Bell is reach out to those vets and offer them our services starting in September at a significant discount. We're hoping to be able to do online instruction in September and that would reduce uh, the cost down to something manageable for our veterans. Here's Ian. That is NCO, NCO um, badge. I had to go to a warriorship leader school for that. Um, that is, the center one right here is, is my Iraqi badge, that's the United States Armed Forces badge. Being in the Army was, that was what I wanted to do. Um, I was, I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be in the Army. No, I, I went in when I was 27 and I got out when I was 31. I married my wife when I got out of basic training. Uh, I don't know if I feel different. I just know how I feel right now. Um, I feel like, like um, sometimes my life is a movie, or sometimes I don't feel like, like I don't know, uh, like 
reality is not the same or something. I don't. I, 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 it's hard to understand. Uh, when uh, in upstate New York, it, it snows seven months out of the year, and it snows a lot. So we were moving um, a Black Hawk helicopter um, on the flight line, and it was really windy and um, cold and snowing. And there's ice all over on the uh, on the on the airfield. We eventually came to the decision that we were uh, going to move the the Black Hawk. We thought that the wind had died down enough, and I was told to pull the chalk wheels from the tail wheel. And as soon as I did that, the thing right in my head. Hit me up right on the side. And I was knocked out for, uh, they say, uh, about a minute and a half. What I remember is just bits and pieces walking. Uh, I remember my head and my shoulder and my back hurting a lot. Um, I eventually went to to the med station, and the doc didn't really, he didn't really seem too concerned about my head. Um, he was more concerned about my shoulder and my back. Um, even, he, he put my arm in a sling and uh, he gave me pain pills for my back and he just told me to drink water, drive on. Um, I did that. Yeah, I went to Iraq. Um, I, I was medevaced out of Iraq uh, uh, late 2009, um, suffering still from the same injuries that I received from the accident. And they sent me to a, some room or something and there was a lady in there and she's sitting behind a desk and she goes, I'm going to give you a list of 10 objects and we're going to wait two minutes and then um, uh, tell me uh, how many you get and I, I got three uh, and then the next time I got four um, and then red flags right after that. Right at that moment is, is where I, I was being informed that, that they think that I had a brain injury and then they started asking. He didn't realize about his injury um, until probably a year after the fact and in that year um, we had extreme problems in our mm -hmm. marriage because of um, the fact that his memory wasn't functioning as well. Like tell so, him things um, and, and uh, you know remind him about things and things weren't getting done and he was forgetting a lot and and to me, I took that as he didn't care, he wasn't listening, and you know, disregarded everything. So I, it was a relief. It was honestly a very big relief because, um, I mean, it was good to know that it was not really anything. It wasn't anything he had control over, um, and it explained it so much that uh, it was just a relief. To go from being a smart individual um, to being a smart individual that now has problems. Uh, learning or just saying things, it's um, it's very unassuring to to it was to me. So I had a lot of self doubt self doubt issues. Uh, here I am, I'm, I'm supposed to be a trained combat warrior, and I'm scared of just life. I, it's you don't you don't you don't want to you don't want to let people in on your on your secret. You know, uh, you just you, you don't. Uh, it's, it's hard as an adult to sit there and, and tell another adult I'm having problems reading. I, I went to, I think, the VA and I told them that I was having trouble reading and that I was having trouble with math and I was having memory problems. The VA is there to assist us. You know, they have this rehab rehabilitation <laughs> program and they've allowed, you know, him to, you know, enter Linda Moon, uh, Linda Moon Bell. They told me that there was a learning center here. Um, and then uh, they, they, they could help me with uh, all of my, well they can try to hone in and perfect what uh, damage has been done or something and help me read better, comprehend better. They're as, as passionate about trying to fix it as much as I am. So four hours a day, five days a week, me coming here um, and I think with them really caring and trying and me coming here with the, the want to learn of how to fix this, um, we're make, I think we're making really big progress. It's a repetitive process of doing it over and over and over again to train the brain to, to, to fix it, to find another route, to, you know, to bypass that damaged area. He is dedicated and doing what he can and I mean I, I feel it's improved. So, he's doing great. Well, I, I love going to Linda uh, Mabel. 
Um, I love being there. I love uh, um, being with the instructors, talking with them, learning from them. I love seeing how um, this whole process has gone through. I mean, I guess I'm uh, one of the few uh, Americans that they, has learned to, to read twice, I guess, or to comprehend. Uh, we're going through the whole process over again, so I'm, I basically started from the beginning. This is very humbling. I, 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 I think deep down inside my heart that, that um, I will always have this brain damage, but we can try to reroute information to try to get past it. Um, at least to make life better. Not that life is bad or anything. Um, it's just tough yeah. you know, when, you're, when you're having deficiencies like this, I guess. That's very moving. And now, and I wanted him to be a face for you because it's one thing to see data. It's another to realize that every person in here, every one of that, the end of 17, is somebody like um, Ian. So this is our data, obviously not as many. Uh, we've seen in, uh, 17 individuals that came to us with uh, pre-diagnosis of TBI. And this is after 113 hours of instruction. Um, when I looked at this data, I was very impressed with a couple of things here. If you look at word attack, they came in high in word attack and okay in word recognition. But look where they were really struggling with accuracy, reading uh, paragraphs accurately and in comprehension, oral directions. Not vocabulary, by the way. And you can see that this is a decent change. This is an excellent change. And this is OK. When I now show you the standard scores, you'll see that their oral direction standard score change was extremely um, large. Their accuracy was extremely large. Um, word recognition was large. And again, I say to myself, as after 113 hours, what would happen if we had the opportunity to double that or triple that? It could make a significant difference. So uh, more, even more so than we made. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye to you uh, and end with this, that our goal is to help all these students, all the students, the questions that you sent me, be independent in their ability to process language. In order to do that, they have to self-correct. In order to self-correct, they have to monitor. And the only way they can monitor is with sensory input, either symbol imagery or concept imagery. And my last thought with you is that 30 years ago, and I'll cry, 30 years ago, I was able to connect my life with Pat Linda Mood. And I know if she was here, she'd say what I'm saying to you. Lucky us for getting to do this with our life. Thank you. Here's uh, me joining you again on May 18th. I'd love for you to do that. If you can make it, send in a question if you have it. Thank you.